Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Miser Global Conversations, a lecture by uh, Professor Parthal Chatterjee. Uh, Professor Chatterjee is uh, so well known that he almost does not need an introduction. Uh, this lecture focuses on the material in his uh, latest book on uh, populism. Professor Chatterjee is uh, in Kolkata, where he is, uh, well, where he has been resident um, and uh, former director and currently uh, attached to the center for uh, several decades. Uh, he's also senior researcher at the Department of uh, Anthropology and um, Department of MISAS, Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University. Professor Chatterjee will speak for roughly an hour and after that, we will have two discussants. Our first discussant uh, will be Dr. Ede Bangerezako. Dr. Bangerezako is a postdoctoral fellow at Miser. And the second discussant will be Dr. Samson Bezabe, who is a research fellow at Miser. Uh, both the discussants will have uh, 10 to 12 minutes each after which Professor Chatterjee will respond also 10 to 12 minutes. And then um, we will move on to a general discussion. The general discussion will be as usual uh, in rounds of uh, three comments, uh, followed by a response by Professor Chatterjee and then another round of three comments and so on. Uh, I request that uh, those who want to make comments, please uh, send your name and your affiliation uh, using the chat function, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, I will recognize you uh, after reading what is on the chat function. Uh, if you have any comments, please also send these on the chat function. If you have any comments while people are talking, feel free to send this on the chat function. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Professor Patho Chatterjee. Welcome, Professor Chatterjee. Thank you very much for um, giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, speak to all of you and these rather unusual circumstances. I haven't done this very often. In fact, I was trying to recall when was the last time I actually spoke to other people uh, in this sort of Zoom uh, configuration. I, 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 I doubt that I've done that too many times. Um, and, um, but nevertheless, this is a new kind of experience, I suppose, among lots of things that might change in our daily lives, this may be one of those uh, that may actually become a permanent feature of our, uh, our education experience in, in the days to come. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mehmood in particular, for organizing this. Uh, <clears throat> I um, volunteered to speak on democracy and populism. Uh, so just to begin with uh, something that's very topical, uh, I just came across the other day uh, a longish essay by John Gray, the uh, British political philosopher. Uh, he is known as a conservative thinker uh, from Cambridge, uh, who's written lots of books on political theory. 
Well, this essay, which was published in early April uh, in the British magazine, The New Statesman, uh, John Gray is painting a very grim picture for liberal democracy in the days to come, especially following uh, this experience of the uh, COVID-19 corona epidemic. <clears throat> uh, what he's saying is that uh, liberal capitalism, he says, will come to an end. Governments will curb the global market. In other words, globalization in the way we've known it in the last, uh, let's say, 30 years or so, uh, will no longer uh, operate in that way. In fact, what will happen is governments, uh, the nation state will be strengthened. Uh, most regimes will begin to think of their own narrow national interest first, rather than uh, cooperating on a global uh, um, space. Uh, what he's also saying, and this is particularly uh, important uh, in terms of our discussion today, people will accept greater surveillance, uh, bio surveillance, surveillance over their lives in exchange for security. There will be more state intervention in the economy as well in order to revive uh, employment and demand in the market and so on. Uh, so to get the economies back uh, into a path of growth. And the sum total, John Gray is saying, will be that liberal democracy as we know it, uh, liberal capitalism as we know it, will come to an end. Uh, and something called post-liberal government, whatever that form is, will be the norm. Now, we can examine the, uh, how far this, this prognosis is justified by going back to uh, democracy as it's evolved in more recent times. Um, in fact, if you, <clears throat> so let me begin with this topic of democracy. First, uh, before I come to what's being called populism, uh, democracy, properly speaking, I will argue, uh, is a fairly recent phenomenon the world over. Now, we know, of course, that in terms of the usual histories of democracy that we, uh, we study, uh, <clears throat> it's often taken back several centuries. I mean, certainly uh, lots of arguments have been made about democracy being inaugurated in the French Revolution or the American Revolution <clears throat> in the late 18th century. Uh, in the case of England, it's taken back even further to, I don't know, some people uh, take it as far back as the Glorious Revolution, let's say, in the 17th century, or even earlier to the Magna Carta. But all of those are, I will argue, they, those histories, they, they, are, they are genealogies of what we understand as democracy today. But democracy in its fully fledged form that we've known in recent times did not actually come into fruition before certainly the middle of the 20th century. Uh, I say this because, first of all, people often don't realize this, that one of the characteristic features of electoral democracy, liberal democracy as we know it, is the is universal suffrage, the idea that every citizen has a vote and has one vote. Now this feature only came into, into operation even in Western Europe or in North America, in the United States, for instance, not before the 1920s, because women, for instance, got the suffrage, full suffrage, only in the 1920s. There are countries in Europe, I believe 
Switzerland, women got the vote only in the 1960s. And then in the United States, we know, for instance, that most African Americans did not have the vote until the 1960s, the civil rights legislation. So it's really from, properly speaking, and then of course, even if when uh, in Europe, democracy, you might say there was full adult franchise <clears throat> in by the 1920s, that history was interrupted by the Second World War, uh, when of course, as we know, many European countries which were democratic before became fascist and, uh, and authoritarian. <clears throat> and so it's only really after World War II that democracy as we know it flourished, came to flourish in Europe and the United States. And then following the various uh, uh, liberation movements and the end of colonial rule in other parts of the world, <clears throat> they uh, expanded in other countries. Now, when we look at this history, uh, what is characteristic of these liberal democracies? <clears throat> and I am now speaking mostly of liberal democracy in the West, as we know it, <clears throat> after World War II. The characteristic features were um, Fundamentally, the conferring of universal rights to all citizens, to a livelihood or income, health, housing, and education. Now, these were uh, given in various ways and at various stages, but more or less, these became characteristic features of the way in which liberal democracies uh, came to develop in the Western world. This is broadly characterized as welfare state. Uh, now the crucial idea is that all citizens have a claim to all of these things, which these are political, economic, and social rights as something that simply attaches to citizenship itself. Simply by virtue of being a citizen, one has claim to all of these things and the state guarantees that those things will be met. So if, for instance, if there's unemployment, somebody is out of a job, then the state will provide for a, a, an income uh, during this period when someone is without a job. Similarly, there is a guarantee of health, uh, taking care of health in a public health system. Uh, education, all secondary education is free. And for most of this period, until very recently in Western Europe, for instance, uh, education, higher education too, was free for all citizens. Uh, so housing, for instance, uh, was another area in which basically states guaranteed that if you could not afford your own house, the government will provide for housing, which affordable housing, which you could rent. Uh, so this essentially meant, and this is the crucial argument that I will lead you into in terms of understanding democracy, that it would mean that it's not that these rights being universal actually creates some kind of general equality among all citizens. That in fact did not happen. What happened was that the state exercised a kind of pedagogical uh, function over citizens through first institutions of disciplining, crucially through schools, through the public sphere, um, especially the media, through public entertainment, by which they produced individuals. This was, these were individual citizens or citizen subjects who were produced through this educational system, very much supervised by the state, uh, 
to produce these individuals who would be disciplined into citizenship. They would behave in ways which were consistent with this idea of free individuality. Now, it did not mean, however, that everybody would be the same. One of the most interesting things that happened with the welfare state, for instance, with education, uh, everyone has a right to education. So therefore, everyone could go into school. But then going into college and university, there was a selection mechanism based on the idea of merit. And the whole idea was that you would go in, there was a basic equality, but then there would be a selection based on these sorts of criteria of individual skills, individual talent, and the idea that a greater merit would be rewarded more. Uh, this became, for instance, in Britain, the, uh, it was very interesting if one looks back into some of these, these crucial debates. For instance, when the entire um, uh, health service and the education uh, system was set up, the question became, since the state was paying salaries, the, the question came up, what should be the salary of, let us say, a, a, a surgeon compared to a nurse? Or, or, or what should be the salary of a university professor uh, compared to a school teacher? And that is where the crucial arguments became that although everyone had equal access through this system of, uh, of a state-sponsored um, welfare state, uh, but the outcomes would still be a differentiation among those citizens according to individual criteria, according to individual qualities. So what is crucial then to understand is that this kind of welfare state, this sort of liberal, what Foucault called liberal governmentality, also produces a way through which classes were produced and reproduced within this liberal system based on the idea of universal rights for everybody. This is the interesting thing to understand. So this becomes, so one way in which the state was able to do this was through what I've just described as the institutions of discipline which produced this uh, citizen subject, the model individual, shall we say. On the other side, there were what Foucault called the biopolitical technologies, which is controlling and reproducing populations in the mass. These, these are not individuals, in the mass. So large groups, and this is done through the, in the very large apparatuses, which would now, through the middle of the 20th century, become widespread, very, very large apparatuses of, the, of government, uh, of, of things like the censors, the various surveys, uh, and what would be crucially called policies. You would have, in fact, entire disciplines called the policy sciences, which would go into the question of how masses of people can be identified, their needs, interests, requirements can be ascertained, measured, and then they could be, these things could be uh, supplied to them on a basis of an understanding of calculation of costs and benefits, right? Optimization, optimization would become a crucial uh, technical uh, exercise so that in the mass, you would then have uh, people who would, let's say territorially, how, what should be the density of populations in cities as compared to other places? What should be a transport system? So transport systems, for instance, zonings, building laws, all of these things would become part of a kind of bi biopolitical control 
so as to produce the desirable distribution of masses of populations in through the space of this uh, this, this state. So this brought these two things on both sides are described as uh, the constituting the hegemonic functions. The hegemonic function carried out on behalf of, and this is the crucial thing which a lot of liberal political theory will simply um, you know, not acknowledge, that this is in fact a hegemonic function carried out on behalf of the owners of capital because it is capital, the owners of capital, who dominate and run the economic functions of society in, in, in a liberal democracy. Uh, now, on behalf of capital then, these universal rights, as we say, are ways in which all citizens are, as it were, included within the space of the state, they form so-called base of popular sovereignty on which with their consent various governments they come and go with the consent of the people but fundamentally what these governments achieve in liberal democracy is to carry out this hegemonic function where people are ruled with their consent on behalf of the owners of capital. Now, this is liberal democracy uh, in, in the more classical sense. Or liberal governmentality, more specifically. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, mm, this is particularly beginning with the period from after World War II through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, this was broadly speaking the, the kind of liberal democracy you had in Western Europe, in Britain, in uh, North America, including the United States, Canada, uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> now, there was a pushback against this kind of uh, liberal governmentality or more specifically, a pushback against the welfare state, a critique of the welfare state from within. And, and the uh, ground for this critique was to question the, uh, the, question the idea uh, of universal rights, uh, benefits or welfare uh, claims that were universally granted to everybody simply by virtue of citizenship. The criticism was that this was wasteful and was inefficient and in fact was creating a huge bureaucracy which itself was far too expensive. Now wasteful and inefficient largely because the claim was for instance that something like the public health service, something like the National Health Service in Britain. The argument was that even, so the, the same services were freely available to everybody, irrespective of, of your income. And the claim was that those who could actually afford a private uh, health uh, treatment were also getting it from free from the state and in fact, because those with better incomes were also better connected, more influential, it was very likely that they were actually depriving others who did not have the same economic or social connections uh, or clout. Uh, they were depriving others from the benefits they genuinely needed. Uh, so they were, you know, so uh, a lot of space in the National Health Service could be cleared up for those people who need it by if it was possible to exclude those who could actually afford to buy these services from the market. Similarly for uh, higher education, certainly, the argument was that uh, why should those who 
actually have come from better off families or those whose degrees they would they would immediately convert those degrees into high paying jobs why should they be given free education uh, when they were um, actually excluding those who actually needed the free education far more than they do that the others do so this sort of criticism uh, which came to be known as neoliberal criticism uh, became very strong particularly through the 1970s and this pushback in the end uh, uh, led to the dismantling of the welfare state over time it happened uh, in different phases in different countries for instance uh, it happened most dramatically in britain in uh, during the time of margaret thatcher uh, in the United States, particularly at the time of Reagan, but it's continued ever since. Uh, in in various countries of Europe, it didn't always happen everywhere, but this pushback basically ended up claiming something which now, according to this framework, we should call neoliberal governmentality, which says that let the market make the allocations right let the market decide because it for the most most of the time makes a fair distribution those who actually fail for whatever reason to to get the required uh, their, their necessary uh, resources from the market those are the ones who should be targeted and the state should step in and provide them with those basic amenities, which they cannot avail from the market. So that, that could be health, that could be those that are, say who are, happen to be unemployed, or who happen to be homeless, or uh, who, are, who are qualified, but do not have the means to afford a private education. So those are the ones who should be uh, targeted. Now, the interesting political consequence of this was that whereas under the welfare state, the universal rights also produced mass organizations of laborers and mass political parties organizing citizens' demands on a massive scale. So in all of these countries of Western Europe, liberal democracies was, was accompanied by of sometimes one, two, three, but mass trade unions and mass political parties, usually two or three, uh, with millions of uh, members. Now, these obviously had considerable political clout because simply because of their size and their uh, and, and, and the spread, the mobilizations they could carry out was, was enormous. One of the crucial political consequences of this neoliberal term was that these mass trade unions and the mass political parties were dismantled. Instead, what happened was a turn of policy making to say that we will target small groups with very specific demands, very specific needs, and benefits will be targeted to these small groups. So for instance, if you think of something like health, uh, instead of a national health service, where of course, which covers uh, everybody, and therefore if there are grievances, then potentially everybody could be mobilized uh, to make demands regarding health. Now, the neoliberal turn, what it does is it breaks up these people seeking health services into much smaller groups. They will say, all right, we will look, we will consider the requirements of, let us say, uh, senior citizens, older people who have one kind of problem. Uh, let us say working women have a different kind of problem. And we will break these down into smaller target population, target groups, and consider their demands and try to meet them 
on it on or in terms of these 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 small targeted groups now what this does is crucially political the political consequences that these large mobilizations are then broken up so if for instance if there's a problem or a demand with let us say senior citizens then somehow the they will have to form associations or whatever it is to make those demands to to government but those demands will not necessarily be uh, those that would affect other citizens who are not senior citizens for instance and so this becomes a very crucial technique of governance which would sweep across uh, western europe north america and in fact later on to other countries as well in terms of the new administrative sciences of of governance policy sciences uh, and this crucially uh, ended up there are two things would that that happened because of this one in terms of identifying target populations and their needs and requirements it produced and a huge apparatus of surveying reporting uh finding out what the let us say consumption habits of various groups of people were what were their morbidities what kind of health requirements they had uh what kind of food they ate all of these things became subjects of survey of reporting and crucially of a statistical uh tabulation and 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 an entire exercise of modeling very often relying on probabilistic models that is to say when things are are, are not fully known there is uncertainty there is incomplete information then the whole logic would be based upon probabilities and this would become the key technical instrument of the new form of governmentality which you might call neoliberal governmentality also crucial would be and this is the second consequence the enormous importance of experts those who specialize in particular branches of this sort of information collection and surveillance methods they would become absolutely crucial in terms of policy making so it didn't so uh, for a large range of things governments would basically come to rely upon this kind of statistically processed information on the habits the motivations uh the uh, the and we a very crucial term i'll come explain it in a minute interests of specific groups of people and then accordingly make policy uh if you if you look at what's happening right now in terms of the corona epidemic and what needs to be done i'm sure every day we see on television these charts which are produced uh which effectively uh represent certain movements of numbers right so many people uh, reported so many people tested so many people uh who died and so on and so forth and these movements of on of the on, on the graph they are used to make arguments about when the the epidemic is supposedly reaching its peak when it is going to reach a plateau when it is going to come down and accordingly and this is where policy is going to be based accordingly the decisions will be made should there be a lockout lockdown should transportation be allowed should schools be open should should businesses be closed or not and all of these kinds of crucial policy decisions are supposedly <clears throat> dependent upon precisely this kind of statistically grounded information uh it's it's uh, what's what's crucial here is i mean if for instance a, a phrase that you'll probably hear be hearing all the time the last few days is is follow the data and the data will tell you what kind of policies government should take 
Now, this of course is a very special case, but broadly speaking, this neoliberal turn in, in uh, Western democracies, which took place, as I said, broadly speaking from the 1980s onwards, what that produced was by the, by the early 2000s, even, certainly the 1990s, uh, it produced widespread apathy, what was called apathy. Uh, people simply did not find politics interesting, largely because there was little to choose between different parties because there was a broad convergence of expert opinion on various policies and the main political parties, broadly speaking, followed that consensus with minor differences. And so in terms of choosing between this or that party, there was very little to choose. And so you, we found by the, by the 1990s, uh, even the early 2000s, people at large, uh, sections of the of citizens didn't bother to vote, didn't bother to find out about particular political uh, events, and there was a general disinterest. It's in this context that populism arose. And this is where I will <clears throat> now turn to this question of populism in the rest of my uh, talk. Uh, and crucially, uh, I've asked you to read uh, the shorter essay by Laclau. Laclau has a larger book, which is called On Populist Reason. If you're interested, you, you should read it. It's, a, it's an important book. Uh, and he supplies a particular kind of uh, analysis uh, of populism in, in this new context. Uh, which I think is useful, uh, and I will do. Uh, I will follow that to make my remaining points on populism in more recent periods and what we seeing right now in different parts of the world. <clears throat> now, the crucial. Uh, argument that Laclau makes is a distinction between what he calls the logic of difference and the logic of equivalence. Now, the logic of difference goes like this. If you think of the way in which neoliberal governmentality operates, which I explained just now, which is to target, to identify specific groups and then make an assessment of their demands and how far, to what extent, those demands might be met by government. Now, this Laclau calls the logic of difference because there are a variety of heterogeneous demands in society. At any given time, there'll be, you know, literally hundreds of different groups who would be making demands on government. All demands cannot be met. Now, the logic of the differential democracy is that over time, various demands of various people will be met, but not all of them will be met all the time. The, and since the whole logic of this is to break up target groups into small uh, sizes, the possibility of large agglomerations, large mobilization, massive mobilization of the kind that could happen, uh, that used to happen in the 1950s and 60s, those are avoided. You, you do not have, uh, uh, you, you, you get rid of the danger of these large oppositional mobilizations. But the difficulty is <clears throat> that since all demands cannot be met, you always left with various groups of people in societies whose demands have not been filled. Is it possible now for someone 
for some leader or some movement to tie together, string together these various unfulfilled demands, which do not necessarily have anything in common between them because they're very heterogeneous. Is it possible to tie together those different demands into something by which it could be argued by this leader of this movement that these are all unfulfilled demands of the people and there is that section which is in power who are denying us our legitimate genuine demands this is what populism does if a leader or a party or a movement is able to do this that is to say able to tie together these heterogeneous unfulfilled demands right into what Lacknau calls equivalence if they could say that yes our, our demands may all be very different but they're all same in one sense because they are equivalent the equivalent demands which are being denied by this one group which is in power now if this is possible how is it possible uh, uh, how, how is it made possible i'll come to that in a minute if and when this is possible then what happens is that there is what laclau calls an internal frontier that is created between the people on the one side all of these people all of those whose demands have not been filled and the elite in power on the other side, which becomes the enemy of the people. That is what populism, a successful populist movement, has to be able to do. How is it able to do it? Now, this is where uh, Laclau says that the way it is done is that rhetorically, you have to produce this you have to fill up what in semiotics is called an empty signifier. The people is, is just an empty abstract thing, right? You have to fill this up rhetorically through representations. You have to fill this up with a variety of unfulfilled demands. Groups identify these groups who are supposedly all part of the people. Right? This has to be achieved, done rhetorically. These demands then, and Laclau uh, points this out, that in trying to fill this up, the demands will lose their specificity because you cannot make specific, the specific demands will always be for uh, relative to very small sections. If you have to include everybody who are supposedly being oppressed, then the demands also become vain. So a lot of populist demands, the kinds of things that, that they describe as the nature of oppression, the nature of things that are denied, they become very uh, vague. But what Laclau says is that this vagueness is not a sign of weakness. In fact, it is the vagueness of the demand that makes populist appeals effective because it is able to include more and more of the people as those who are part of the oppressed. Now, there's an interesting argument that Laclau makes which, which we can uh, debate. Laclau thinks that when populism emerges as an oppositional movement against so an entrenched elite which is in power, and then is able to come to power, that's to say to remove this particular group and come to power. Then he says, generally speaking, what would happen is that populism would lose this logic of equivalence. And because now it being in power, it will have to satisfy demands. And since all demands cannot be satisfied, it will gradually tend to go back, to fall back upon the logic of differentiation, the difference logic. 
right? That that would be the so if a populist movement or a party comes to power, then over time it will cease to be populist. Now there is an interesting argument that could be made. Uh, Laclau was of course making this in relation to uh, particularly the Peronists in Argentina. Uh, to say he he actually mentions also uh, certain. African regimes, uh, particularly those who fought liberation movements, won liberation movements, and then came to power. And then gradually, the, that populist appeal was lost because in terms of uh, governing, they had to fall back upon these, this logic of difference, satisfying s specific demands of specific groups. Now, there are, it, there are examples from other places, particularly there's a, a long uh, series of examples from particular uh, states in India, for instance, where populist parties have continued over decades. And the way this was achieved is, is through what in semiotics could be called by creating a floating signifier of, for the people, where the contents can be changed over time. So it's not that a single content, the contents can change over time. And this is very largely achieved by identifying the people with the person of a leader. I'll come immediately to uh, next to the topic of the leader because that is absolutely crucial to the discussion of populism. That what happens is that the leader person is identified with the idea of the people. The leader personifies the people. Now, if that is the case, then if over time the leader's opponents change, the leader changes his positions, he, he makes new alliances, for instance, creates other new, uh, new enemies. Every time this happens, the new enemies become the enemies of the people. So in a sense, what happens is that there is still that frontier, that internal frontier between the people and those who oppose the people. But those who oppose the people are by definition, and this of course has to be achieved rhetorically uh, and through representation. But once it is successfully achieved, what happens is that the leader enemies become identified as the people's enemies. And if the leader's enemies change, the people's enemies also change. Now, what is the leader? The leader is absolutely a crucial uh, element in, uh, in, in populism, in populist <clears throat> uh, movements and, and regimes. The leader, <clears throat> ends up centralizing power around a single person. No competitor is allowed. The leader represent, is represented as the protector of the oppressed, particularly the poor and the underprivileged. Uh, the leader distributes benefits to the people and I'll come to this in a minute. But crucially, and this is where populism is related to democracy, the leader, this leader, must continue to win popular approval, to validate his leadership through popular approval in elections. So this populist leader is not a dictator. One of the crucial things about populism in recent times is that very often it, it is possible that the elections may not entirely be fair. The, uh, the uh, populist leader could very well repress the opposition, not allow the opposition to function uh, in the way in which a free and fair election would, would require. But it is necessary to hold elections 
it is necessary to have competing parties and leaders, and it is necessary to demonstrate that the leader has the approval of a majority of the people. This is a very important characteristic of contemporary populism. So that even though it was possible, why did not many of the populist leaders uh, who have emerged in recent times, why did not they simply abandon electoral democracy as lots of dictators used to do earlier on? Uh, why didn't they do that? Because in a sense, this leadership is based on a certain relation to the people, which requires this act of validation. I'll come to this now and elaborate what uh, populism, contemporary populism requires. So there are two sides to contemporary populism. <clears throat> One is what could be called governmental populism, uh, which, is, which is the distribution of benefits to the supporters, to those who are supposedly part of the people. This is what the leader does or the regime, the populist regime does for the people, distribute benefits. This is distributed usually through a bureaucracy. Now, initially, when uh, populist leaders made these, initially came about, so you can think of uh, Peron in Argentina, most interestingly, Mrs. Peron, the Eva Peron in Argentina uh, early on. Uh, or if you, um, if you think of, in the Indian case, Indira Gandhi in the 1970s, uh, this was relatively new, this idea of a leader distributing benefits to the people. But now this has become a very general feature of not just distinctly populist regimes, any, almost any electoral democracy, you will find leaders and parties who will do this <clears throat> basically to make the, make the appeal, vote for us and we will give you this. Now, this is widespread now. You even have something which could be called competitive populism so that in an electoral democracy where the rival party will try to outbid the other in distributing benefits to their supporters. So this governmental uh, populism, which, which originally was populism, I don't think is any longer a distinct feature of populist regimes. It has now become widespread in general. Even regimes which cannot be described as populist will often resort to this. What is distinct? is the ideological dimension. And this ideological dimension, as I said, crucially involves the representation of the people versus the enemy, this, this conflict. And this representation occurs in the following way. The leader is like the sovereign. Now, I'm making a very crucial argument about a specific kind of populism, but if you now look at uh, lots of populist leaders today, uh, you will find this characteristic becoming stronger everywhere. That the leader is like a sovereign, like an absolute sovereign, all right? who has absolute power to fight the enemies and to deliver justice to the people. But this leader is not like the monarchs and kings of olden days, because this is a leader who is popularly chosen, right? A sovereign-like leader with absolute powers who does not have to abide by rules and laws and so on, who can cut through those bureaucratic, uh, uh, you know, constraints and deliver justice and defeat the enemies of the people, right? And this leader, but the crucial difference is, 
that this leader is been chosen by the people, a popularly chosen leader. Now, what this means is that this particular image or representation of the leader has to be rhetorically, visually, dramatically produced and reproduced all the time. And this becomes a crucial part of populist politics today. I am emphasizing in particular the visual media because most of the material that I know well uh, comes from a country like India, where of course <clears throat> most people do not read as a matter of habit. Uh, there is far greater influence of the visual media. Uh, cinema was used to be a very, very important media. And of course, many of you are aware of the fact that in several Indian states, uh, people from the cinema industry, actors in particular, who were earlier just huge stars without any political uh, standing, were converted into political leaders almost sometimes overnight, right? Uh, but it's not just cinema stars. I think given the spread of visual technology, television, cinema, uh, and now of course social media, I think it's very crucial how the representation of the leader and the relationship between the leader and the people, that is continuously produced, recreated, and sometimes these things you know, stop working. You can, you can probably see the image of leaders uh, coming apart uh, because of the failure to maintain this particular relationship between the leader and leader as sovereign and the fact that he is also chosen by the people. Uh, one of the interesting things that I think is very uh, crucial is the narrative form of the melodrama. The melodrama as a very crucial narrative form of populist democracy, uh, where there's a, a fight between good and evil and good win wins, prevails over evil. That is a broad narrative form which keeps repeating many, many times in this uh, field of the creation of the image of the populist leader. Now, there is uh, a distinction that is often made between left-wing populism and right-wing populism. Um, we can talk about this in greater detail uh, when we have a discussion later on. Uh, but the crucial, the important question I think is that even when regimes have been identified as left-wing populism, for instance, uh, regimes like that of Chavez in Venezuela or Lula in, in, in Brazil or Morales in Bolivia and so on, and you can think of others, uh, where it is certainly true that these were regimes which were able to provide for a very significant set of benefits uh, for the poor to lift a lot of people out of poverty, uh, but one must remember that all of this was possible, was dependent on the profitability of a capitalist sector of the economy from which these regimes drew their resources. So in the case of Chavez, it was oil and oil uh, uh, dependence of, from oil revenues from sales in the world market. Uh, in many other cases, for instance, in the case of Brazil, it was a whole range of other commodities which were exported. Uh, so there is a very crucial dependence of contemporary populist regimes, even when they're left-wing, on, the on maintaining the profitability of the capitalist sector from which they would draw 
their revenues, which they could then spend on what is called the social sector, that is to say, in providing benefits and so on to their constituents. Now, as a result, one of the crucial things about left-wing populism these days is that their, <clears throat> uh, their, their politics is necessarily tactical. That is to say, taking policy decisions to benefit their constituents with a view to the next election, but without endangering, without fundamentally confronting the structures of property and the structures of capitalist relations on which the broader economy is based. So as a result, you could, uh, I would certainly argue that left-wing populisms do not have a transformative agenda, a, an agenda to say that we will transform the nature of society fundamentally from the way it is now. It is crucially tied to the existing structure of society. It's very ironical in some ways that it is right-wing populists who have been able to make, to be, to be far more radical in disrupting liberal democracy uh, and direct uh, popular anger against the elites. Now, it's, this is not to say that right-wing populism has any transformative agenda in relation to the ownership of, of, of property or, or structures of capitalism. Very often, they depend on that same uh, structure of economic dominance. But what's interesting is that they are able very often to operating within those constraints to be disruptive of uh, the liberal, uh, the more pluralist kinds of liberalism and direct popular anger, the anger of ordinary people against minorities, against immigrants. And you see this across a wide range of right-wing populists. Now, a final comment on the nature of uh, the possibilities of transformation and so on, uh, whether populism can transform. And my general argument is that it cannot. And an even more important uh, question there, it seems to me, is that if one looks at fundamental social classes, which have or could have uh, hegemonic uh, ambitions of transforming society, then the fact is that it is only owners of capital today who have, which is the only fundamental class, which has both the organization as well as the consciousness, the foresight, a, the vision for a future, sometimes immediate future, sometimes even a long range future, but they have, the owners of capital are, have this fully organized form of a fundamental class. All the other possible fundamental classes are thoroughly demobilized and scattered. So that is a situation in which populism operates. And it seems to me completely, at least at this moment, limits the possibility of populism actually achieving some kind of trans social transformation. So if that's my analysis then, so let me finally come back to this question with which I began. Um, <clears throat> what is this present crisis, which seems to be completely global crisis now, and of course, one that was not foreseen, it was, it was extraneous. There's nothing within the social uh, structures of the economies and so on, which brought about this present crisis. But the crisis that's been caused by <clears throat> the, the health epidemic, the crucial uh, characteristic is of course, uncertainty. Nobody knows really what's going on and what's going to happen. So first of all, there's no uh, certainty as to 
when the crisis will end, uh, the uh, there is how you know when the disruptions to economic and social life <clears throat> uh, could go on for months. Some people are saying it could go on for two or three years, well, possibly. Uh, it's opened up <clears throat> one very important thing. It's opened up is the divide between what I've called the distinction between the formal and the informal sectors of the economy. If you look at particularly the for countries in the world outside the West, one of the crucial things that's happened is that whereas traditional uh, economies, the traditional sectors like agriculture have crumbled, the people who have lost their livelihoods in those uh, sectors have not been absorbed in the modern sectors of uh, the cities and the industries. They have formed this huge mass of what are called informal sector workers, many of whom are self-employed, others are employed only periodically, a lot of them are migrants. Now, this sector, I would argue, in fact, has now become the principal, if you describe them in economic terms, it's become the principal quote unquote class that is exploited now by the entire formal organized sector, which includes both corporate industry and business. Uh, it includes not just the owners and managers and so on, uh, and the salaried personnel, but even workers in the formal sector who are, as you can see, uh, in terms of the consequences of something like a lockdown, uh, they are completely protected. These are people whose salaries are guaranteed. Very often they're, in, they're simply being asked to stay home uh, without really um, any demands being made on, their, the, on losing their earnings or anything like that. Uh, on the other hand, the people who have been completely thrown uh, to complete insecurity, loss of uh, livelihood, and very often without even guarantee of shelter or food, is this informal sector. This is true. I'm saying it's most starkly evident in, in a country like India, we are watching this on television every day here. But even in the West, it seems to me, this is the sector which is most, most directly and most adversely affected. Now, this crisis, when it is over or even when it is relatively mitigated, uh, may lead, it seems to me, will certainly lead to even greater inequalities and to the state protection of corporate capitalist and state sectors, government sectors. It seems to me they will not be exposed to the ravages of the economic ruin that's going to follow, the devastation that's going to follow. People may actually be willing to accept loss of liberty for greater security, which will mean authoritarian tendencies will strengthen. But, and this is where in relation to populism, I think there's an interesting problem which we don't know how it will uh, work out. The populist distribution of benefits, which is so crucial for populism today, that may not be possible because of the shrinking economy. In other words, the crucial lifeline of populism, which is to, not just to keep uh, reproducing and refurbishing the image of the leader, but also to do this by continuously uh, distributing benefits to the supporters. This is likely to be hampered because there will be very few, little resource 
to distribute. In that case, the link between populism and democracy, which I had argued was crucial, that might end up by electoral democracy being scrapped, even if temporarily. So that, it seems to me, is a very major danger that is lurking around the corner. Uh, I will end at this point. Uh, and of course, when we come back uh, for a wider discussion, I'm, I'll be very happy to have uh, to react to your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patho. Um, I will resist the temptation to uh, a sum up or uh, or ask a question until until later. Uh, for now, it's my uh, huge pleasure to introduce our first discussant, uh, Ede, Dr. Ede Bangerezako, postdoctoral fellow at McCrary Institute of Social Research. Ede. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your insightful presentation, Professor Chatterjee. Um, in the in the I am the people chapter, um, the professor, you are concerned with what form of meaningful participation of the people in politics is possible without necessarily leading to um, the election of a populist leader. So you show us um, a sort of a parallel between the rise of populist leaders in the north who um, share where you can, we can also locate them and see populist leaders in the south. And you try to answer how this happens. Um, you also show us what are the different stages which have led um, um, to a Western democracies and uh, what, how in a different sequence in the post-colonial states. Um, so populism occurs in democratic politics where um, the rights of citizenship of the population are recognized by the states allowing um, citizens to become political actors, irrespective of class, ethnicity, and question. Um, so you should tell us that populism is not connected to the pre-modern era, and that um, it is actually the modern state which, has gave birth to, which gave birth to it through popular sovereignty and a representative um, government. So you explain to us that it's actually the crisis of hegemony which has caused this and which has resulted in two interesting prototypes that you tell us. So in the North, um, using Gramsci, you tell us about this tactical contraction of the integral state where the market forces rule and where uh, this moral sense of participation and sovereignty has been uh, decimated. And there's um, a minimal level of subsistence is ensured. Whereas in the South, you explain to us as a tactical extension of the state, where the state uh, seeks to cater for those with property and urban middle class, but also extends to the poor, informal, and rural population without necessarily considering them as citizens. So, um, so then you tell us also how. Um, one of your prescription, you tell us how power operates in the production also of historical narratives. When you study, when you bring in um, the concept of the people nation and the nation state, referring to those who are writing about um, Indian civilization. So this is an early history writing project, which has strong roots, which has continued and which is discriminatory and excludes others. And you talk about how it can be resolved and you bring up a federated people's nation. So uh, an Indian nation state made up of different federated people under a sovereign um, state. Um, so uh, some of my questions are the following. Uh, I, I, was, I wanted to ask a question questions about um, thinking about your arguments here, um, wh how, where do you locate the legacy of the colonial states um, when we're thinking about 
colonial bio power in the colonial state and how do we connect it how do we think about this legacy in the post-colonial state and the populism that we've had in in the in the in the south um, so how do we study this role of the states in the north and the south when they have different hi historical trajectories and different economies and market forces um, and how do, you, do we manage to reach a similar crisis um, yet despite all these differences that we have um, the, how do we manage to this crisis of the nation state so what kind of state are we imagining what what kind of state can we imagine that um, where horizontal conflicts based on class, ethnicity, um, gender can be resolved. Um, so you mentioned one of your suggestions for India is a federated people nation. How will that resolve social and political conflict? Um, so you also raise an important question in the chapter about who knows best the people's welfare? Is it the state or citizen subjects? So it's, you talk to us about hege hegemony and leadership, balance of force and consent, governmentality and political sovereignty. So how do we think about consent in uh, our states where, um, where with our economies where elections have become more about performance, violence, and uh, creating enemies. Um, even this concept of people nation. So when does it, what does popular sovereignty mean when all citizens are not treated equally and or equally recognized by the state? Whether it, based, it is based on gender, class, or in the North we see um, former migrants who are now citizens, but they are not necessarily recognized as such. Um, so whose demands from which group are deemed to be considered by the state based, based on who's, which interests? So who are the people? And I am the people. Um, and also, uh, I think you also addressed it. So how do we think about the states in the North and South in light of uh, COVID-19. We've seen um, um, how the state in the West, it's, it's failures in uh, sort of um, providing what uh, populations were in need of, um, whereby in the South, we've seen more um, active intervention, which is not always necessarily good, but how do we think about the role of the state in light of uh, COVID-19. Um, thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ede. Uh, our second discussant is uh, Dr. Samson Bezabe. Okay, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. It has been, it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to comment on, on your work. Um, because I've, I've been reading your work for a very long time. Um, so my comments is basically divided into into four or five concerns, which I would um, I would which I have termed them differently. So my first concern has to do with um, with what I call monotemporality and dichotomy. Um, you it, you tend to make a distinction between the nation state on the one hand and territory and population on the other, on the other hand. The latter. Um, is thought as being penetrable by the former. It is the state that penetrates population and territory. Its, penet its penetration enhanced unifying capacity is however made dependable on what you say is the scaffolding built by the nation state. So my concern in this perspective of yours is, is the dichotomy that you make between the nation state on the one hand and the territory and population on which the state acts upon. So this is fundamental, this is one of the building block that you have, uh, or the assertion that you made in terms of um, analyzing populism. From my perspective, this assertion, which I think is highly driven by uh, 
the work of Michel Foucault is interesting, but it seems to be rather simplistic and problematic as it masks other possibilities. Um, the first possibility that it masks, I believe, is this possibility of the state being caught by societal practices. A number of work indicate this possibility that the state does not only penetrate the territory and population, but the practice in, the, in society penetrate the state and engulfs and render it into a non-emancipated state itself. The second possibility that is masked by your assertion, I, I think, is this, is this issue of multiple temporality in which the state is itself embedded, is embedded in. In your work, it seems that the nation state is only embedded in one temporality, and that temporality is intimately connected with colonialism and capital, both of which emanate from the West. I'm wondering if the state is not also embedded in multiple temporality, the nation state. The nation state, I believe, is also embedded in pre-colonial societal history or time, as well as in dynamics that emanate after colonialism. From my perspective, there are multiple temporalities in which the state is embedded in. Would it, be, would it be more useful and more enriching and hence more conducive for our, uh, of our understanding of populism um, if you view the nation state in such manner rather than, rather than just think through capital time? If we follow Bourdieu, for example, the state has its own mentality, and this mentality is important for creating vision and division. The work of Bruce Kaffer, uh, for example, was significant in showing how the state was embedded in certain cosmologies that become important in how it relates and governs population. Taking the cosmologies that become important, um, uh, taking the cosmology that became important in how it relates and govern population. Uh, so by taking the case for, of Sri Lanka, for example, um, Kafara shows how the relation between the Sinhalese and the Buddhists within the state has been shaped by the cosmology that existed in the long durée history of the society. In view of all this, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be possible to think in terms of multiple temporality as this, the nation state is not only shaped by capital and the colonial, by mul but, but by multiple factors that have originated in different temporalities. These temporalities need not to be taught in terms of succession, but as occurring simultaneously. In this way, I think we will avoid stabilizing the West and its capital. In short, um, what I think is that by not embr embracing multiple temporality um, in, in explaining how our present condition, of how our present condition is shaped, um, you tend to give or present a reading that just focus on one story that emanates from the West. And in so doing, you tend to stabilize the West by making it ever present. The paradox is that um, this happens even when the actual goal is tracing other tra trajectories of capital in non-Western contexts, such as in India. Uh, as after all, the history and trajectories um, that is searched for is the history of capital and the nation state that emanate from the colonial context and indirectly the West. Um, so from my perspective, the attempt to find other stories, I think collapse on itself as the West is actually stabilized by giving, by giving a story that link all development in the other to three factors which form a, a sort of trinity, capital, colonialism, and the nation state. This exclude other temporalities, such as the pre-colonial history and cosmology, which keeps having legacy and also development that come after colonialism and that are not linked to it. My second concern um, is on class and emancipation. Um, so you, in, 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 in the material, uh, that you have given, I have also read the entire book, you tell us that in, unlike in Gramsci's time, there is um, in Western democracies today effectively one, only one fundamental class in action, the owner of capital, that has both the consciousness and the organization to pursue its class interest. All, the, all other fundamental class are demobilized and scattered. 
So the underlying assumption in your work seems to link revolution with capital and the bourgeoisie. You tell us that the mass in the West has no revolutionary capacity at the present. By this, you suggest or you state that class, other than the bourgeoisie class, who control capital and who is commanding the state is, is the only effective actor that remains. So the, the bourgeoisie remains, the, they are the effective actors. Um, so, so capital or the bourgeoisies make revolutions, even if it's a passive. Um, I think this way you seem to be linking revolution or emancipatory capacity of making revolution with class only. Um, so in doing this, aren't you excluding other possibility of making revolution? Don't we have, for example, other possibilities of make, make, making revolution or emancipation and obtaining freedom? For example, through self-conduct, if we think, for example, through Foucault using his concept of counter-conduct. Doesn't the Occupy movements um, that we have seen in the West give us an example that demonstrates other possibilities of engaging in revolutionary action or emancipatory action outside a class framework. Uh, this is, for example, what is suggested by the invisible committees that analyzed newer form of resistance that are emerging in the West. Uh, in short, do we need class in order to engage in emancipatory practices? So these two seems to be tied, too tied for me. Um, my, my, third, um, my third concern is you, the, in the empirical material in which you base yourself. Um, I feel that for making assertion on the West, there is no empirical backing. So we are, we are asked to, to, to believe you. Um, but I think on the empirical side, your assertion on the West is, is very thin. Uh, but there is also a problem when it comes to to the empirical material that you, on, on the other, yeah, on, on the non-West. Um, so you seem to think the colonial through the Indian experience. Yeah? This gives, uh, from my perspective, a very Anglo, Anglophone touch to your analysis. Um, uh, so my question is, can we summarize about colonialism and the colonial experience by taking the British colonial experience only? The, create, the current debate on, on colonial and post-colonialism that refers itself as the decolonial school is partly, is partly critical to post-colonial studies in which you seem to be part by pointing this at attitude of understanding colonialism through uh, British colonialism and the experience of the Indian subcontinent. They, they aim to revert it by taking Latin America experience in which race is central. What would be your answer to such criticism of giving a total explanation on colonialism or post-colonialism by taking the case of British colonialism and the experience uh, of the Indian uh, subcontinent? The challenge, I think, is to the challenge, I think, is to build uh, a truly universal and global account of colonialism and encounter by taking by taking the experience of non. British form of colonialism and the experience of a counter with capital outside India. So my question is, do you see your work and analysis as being tied by, it, by these two factors, British colonialism and experience from India? Yeah. And how can this affect your reading and understanding of, of, of populism? My last concern has to do with, um, um, with how you characterize the others. Yeah? Um, so you tend to see, uh, or you, you, you argue that you would like to see development in other contexts. Uh, so the other is the elsewhere, both physically removed from the West and in terms of its, its history. However, you still use conceptual frameworks developed in the West to explain the other. Um, is this not a contradiction? Wouldn't it be more fruitful to see the other or the elsewhere as being part of the similar circles? Yeah. Um, from my perspective, there is also a problem in terms of using uh, the word tradition. Uh, you label the other as traditional society and a society that is being transformed through capital. 
Although I'm sympathetic to this depiction, I have a huge problem with the world, with the world tradition and the way capital is depicted. Your depiction tends to see what is called traditional society as being fixed and tied to a place while capital is portrayed as being mobile. This is in a sense, this in a sense is true, but to what extent can we draw such a huge generalization and engage in unproblematized depiction of traditional society and capital? Uh, how does the so-called traditional society act and respond to capital? What is the nature of their agency? Is it, is it marked by alienation only, as you seem to suggest? Is it one that is always based on reaction and hence is it only reactive to something that's coming from outside? Or should, should it be taught as a two-way process, a process in which traditional societies, which we tend to think in terms of being fixed in place, are also being engaged and mobile and as, as capital. And capital as being not only having the ability to transform the traditional society, but also as being transformed by this traditional society itself. Um, and of course, how do we see the interconnection that, is, that exists between Western class power, with the, the class in the West, and class in, 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 in the context of what, what used to be called the third world, yeah? Because, that, because we have this conception of the transnational class and the transnational states. So I would also like um, to see that connectivity. My last point has to do, to do with your assumption regarding citizenship and population. Um, it seems from my reading that you make a consistent distinction between the domain of citizenship and population. You tend to view the former as being indivisible, while you seem to conceive the latter as multiple entity that requires multiple techniques of governmentality. This distinction has led to a creation um, you say of a hom homogeneous construct of the nation and heterogeneous construct of the social. This is your general argument. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of such dichotomization as, as citizenship, uh, if you think it in terms of a lived experience from my perspective, is hierarchical and penetrable by practice that comes from the social as well. Um, so um, I'm, I'm concerned with, with the binaries. So to summarize, um, what would be um, an alternative account of populism if we, if we avoid um, generalizations? Uh, generalizations? Generalizations that has to do, or um, not generalization, but assertions, fundamental assertions that you make that has to do with capital, the nation state, and capital in the West and in, in other society. So, how can we have an alternative or enriched form of um, understanding if, if, if we take all, all this, um, if we have another or alternative reading um, that, that does not rely on this making of binaries? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. Um, I think we go to uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee for uh, a, an engagement with these uh, two comments. Uh, Partho? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. And uh, thank you very much for, um, for all those comments. By the way, in case you're puzzled by the change of my shirt, it's only because the lecture was actually recorded last week. So I didn't go and change my shirt in between. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you very much for those uh, two comments, um, two sets of comments. Uh, so, to Ede first. Um, now, your question about um, colonial biopower and to, in what way is this linked to, uh, to the kinds of things I was uh, discussing, uh, one could actually go into a much more detailed understanding of how various techniques of biopower may have been introduced even in the colonial period. Uh, there, are, there are accounts um, in different colonial contexts, for instance, on things like um, 
uh, public health and hygiene, for instance. There are a whole set of uh, technical instruments of administration of hygiene, for instance, in the control of, again, what we are looking at now, epidemics. Uh, so earlier on, even in the 19th century, early 20th century, there were a whole series of uh, public health kinds of techniques that colonial states developed uh, in relation to the, to the distribution of food. For instance, rationing um, was a very interesting, in fact, I think it could be argued that proper rationing on a large scale was actually introduced first in India, uh, in, in particularly the 1930s and 40s, especially during the, and it's during the war that rationing of that kind, the same kind of uh, framework was adopted in Britain to uh, make public distribution of uh, various kinds of supplies which were in, in, in uh, which had a shortfall. So um, this is the, uh, you could make arguments of this kind, but I think there is a huge difference between the specific kinds of biopower technologies that the colonial state introduced and the scale, the sheer scale of biotechnologies today uh, that is used by not just uh, post-colonial states, but states everywhere. Uh, it's, it's clearly, it, it tries to encompass the entire population in the mass, right? Uh, in, for, so for instance, if you think of things like reproduction, population control, that's one of those fu fundamental things that have been introduced uh, by the state. So beginning with that, I mean, there's a whole range of things. There's practically no area of life that is left out by the attempts by the state to try and control. So it's just a major difference in time and scale, which leads to a very different understanding of between what the colonial state might have been uh, in relation to larger populations and what modern nation states are today in, in, the, in the second half of the 20th century in relation to their populations. So that's the big difference. The other interesting uh, question you raised was that whereas I've traced the difference between uh, Western democracy and post-colonial democracy in terms of their, their, their evolution, I think one of the interesting uh, points that I wanted to make was how they converge now. You see, this is something which standard theorists of liberal democracy will never accept. And this is one of the things that I wanted to make. I mean, I, it's, it's probably more of a provocation than a full-fledged argument. But the idea that today, for instance, if you take uh, the way in which liberal uh, commentators regard the phenomenon of Donald Trump, and keep emphasizing the fact that this sort of leadership is completely foreign to liberal democracy. This, this, this could never happen. This is the, and they keep referring to these, to the kinds of politics that it represents as tribalism, as, uh, you know, as some kind of um, primitive third world kind of uh, politics that's been imported somehow. The argument I was trying to make is that populism in the West, as we see it today, is actually not an import from somewhere else. It is an internal process. There is an argument that could be made that it is internal to the way in which liberal democracy has had to evolve in more recent times, right? And that's the interesting and important point to make. The uh, question you asked about uh, federalism and the federated uh, peoples, the, the feder federation of peoples constituting the nation. Uh, would conflicts be resolved? I, I would not certainly make the argument that this would resolve conflicts necessarily. It's, it's, it's a question of finding a, a more um, 
shall we say, a more, I would say just, but even if we were to simply say it's a more appropriate and more effective, politically more effective uh, construction of the nations, of the state in relation to the people, to find a more appropriate relation between the state and its constitution and the people as they are constituted. You see, that would be, that's the uh, level at which I am arguing. So what that would mean is that you would have a greater possibility of resolving conflicts at a more local level find you know, local understandings, local ways, a much more uh, limited, territorially limited area within which resolutions might be made uh, of conflicts rather than having a much more um, polarized national level discourse determining everything within that entire space of the nation. This is what I was trying to make the argument that, that perhaps that would give us a, a greater room for achieving those kinds of resolutions. They may be only temporary resolutions, they may be very contingent and limited resolutions, but a greater possibility of finding resolutions to the kinds of conflicts that now seem uh, beyond any resolution. So uh, now, uh, Popular um, sovereignty, what does it, in the end, what does it mean? Well, I, I think I've uh, made the, the claim that what popular sovereignty actually means is, I mean, if you go back to the famous uh, um, definition by, by Lincoln, uh, and I've, I think I've said this in the book, uh, what it means is that in the formal sense, it, you know, uh, government democracy is of the people because the people are formally sovereign, right? It is also for the people, particularly in relation to populist forms of democracy, but it is not by the people in any sense. So therefore, in that sense, popular sovereignty is, is merely an abstract fiction, right? Now, uh, the role of the state in, in COVID, I think, I mean, if, if there are more discussions on this, I have made certain kinds of uh, comments on this, but at the moment things are, are, are evolving and I'm not sure this, the role of the state can actually be understood as yet in the most general sense, because there are different sorts of responses in, in different countries and, and let's face it, I mean, I think every government everywhere is completely fumbling. I mean, they really don't know the real answers because in a sense, there are no given answers. You know, answers have to be invented. Uh, okay, let me come to Samson's uh, uh, comments. I mean, there are several, uh, and some of these we could discuss uh, for much longer than we have time for here. But let me, let me take them uh, one by one. First, in terms of your argument um, that, um, that I, uh, I, I take a nation state as penetrating territory and populations, and you suggest that it is also possible that there is an opposite kind of uh, effect of um, Mm, territories and populations working itself back into the state and affecting or shaping the way in which the state uh, works. Now, this, it's possible to say this, and, and I think it's connected to your, to your second question, which is about the different temporalities. And I think if, if I, I could, connect those two points, I would, I would suggest this, that you're right, that there is the opposite, which could also happen. But how do you begin to distinguish between what is the form, the formal content, the formal, shall we say, structure or concept of a, of a modern nation state, of a modern state, right? 
uh, which works itself out, right? Which puts into practice uh, ways of governing that conform to what is expected of a modern state. Now, yes, there are colonial legacies to this, but there are also, if you think of, of situations today, for instance, you have, you have global forms of understanding of what is expected from a proper state, right? For instance, things like the various agencies of the United Nations and a whole range of other international institutions, organizations, right? Which actually monitor, they advise, they lay down guidelines and all states, to the extent that they are all meant to be members of this global family of nations, uh, they are expected in some way or the other to conform. And let's not forget that there is a whole range of, this is one of the things that I was arguing about governmentality and its necessary dependence over time on experts and experts in the policy sciences. Now, this again tends to produce a set of global practices or a globally recognized way of dealing with these questions of policy making through the various administrative sciences. And it's not simply things that you learn in, in, uh, in, in formal universities, but training courses for administrators, a whole range of uh, technical uh, apparatuses, technical uh, training, right? Which produces a certain uniformity in the way in which governments deal with this. Now, obviously when you, so are, do governments everywhere, everywhere in the world work in the same way? No, necessarily not. And this is where I think the, this, the second question of temporalities becomes interesting because you're right that I, I didn't uh, elaborate on this. If I were to elaborate on this in relation to the topics that I was dealing with in, 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 in both the lecture as well as the book, uh, I would have uh, actually looked at this precisely in relation to the making, the ways in which the, I, the people and the leader are made. I've simply summed this up by saying that this is done rhetorically through representations. But there is, these are, you know, these representations and the way representations would make meaning. What is expected of a leader? How is this particular kind of representation? How does that actually personify the people in the leader. Now, this is very much related to precisely the kind of question you were asking. This does not necessarily come from the temporality of capital time. It doesn't necessarily come from understandings of what leadership in a democracy means in Western countries, in the US or Britain or France or anything. There, there are an entire range of completely, you might say, for want of a, a, a more complex word, indigenous, internal kinds of uh, cultural understandings of what is expected of the leader. And this would definitely have exactly what you're saying. It would carry the sense of a temporality which is not that of capital time, right? Now, this, of course, it would require uh, a much more detailed understanding, empirically based understanding of what, it, but that's just one point. The, you know, how is the people or the leader made? If you were to enter into a whole range of other questions of specific ways, the areas in which governments work, yes, in each of these cases, it's, it's certainly possible to, uh, to produce an account where it's not simply one time produced supposedly in the West, right, which is determining this. There are various uh, uh, temporalities coexisting at the same time. And by the way, you know, Foucault was one of the 
most fundamental thinkers in recent times who's introduced and elaborated on this idea of different temporalities existing at the same time. So, you know, both the uh, understand the idea of uh, archaeology as as well as genealogy is precisely uh, pointing this out. Now, uh, when you say that my account uh, stabilizes the West uh, and the non-West and so on, uh, is produced as the different space, which is somehow being penetrated by this one defined entity called the West. I'll come back again to the response I made to Ede's question, which is that if that were the case, then you would not end up by suggesting that populism as you see it in the West is not an aberration, is not some foreign corrupting import, that it is inherent within the logic of, in the, in the way I put it, of neoliberal governmentality. Neoliberal governmentality confronting this uh, the reality of huge inequalities, huge uh, unsatisfied demands, and a populist leader emerging to claim that all of these heterogeneous demands of people all over, let's say, the United States, are all the result of the common condition of oppression of the so-called genuine American people by an entrenched elite in Washington or wherever. So uh, it is, it, it, I think what I was trying to argue was that this, this is not the feature of a third world uh, democracy. Right, which somehow has, through some inexplicable way, corrupted uh, uh, a Western democracy. So, uh, on the question of revolution, not by class, uh, I'll say this. I mean, again, this is this is a question on which we, should, we could have a much longer discussion as to whether things like uh, the something like counter conduct or the, or the occupy. I, I think I made a few comments about the occupy movements, uh, even in the book, um, and whether or not they represent possibilities of some kind of revolutionary change. Let's uh, let's postpone that. I I uh, it's possible. I, I'm not denying this, but what I would insist is that whereas all of those are movements who, which have emerged and which we often think of as necessary because we find that the other kinds of class movements are no longer possible. On the other hand, this is not a lack from which the owners of capital suffer they are still operating as a class. They can operate as a class. They can organize themselves as a class. I um, actually discussed their response to the financial crisis of 2008-9 and to show how in very specific ways they are able to organize and influence political decisions at the topmost level <laughs> in the United States but in several countries of Europe, in order to come out of the crisis. Uh, and my fear is, you know, say apprehension is, that they may be able to do the same thing now, right? Uh, whereas for those who think of themselves on the other side, we are continuous, we are still uh, groping around for alternative non-class ways of trying to organize. Uh, I'm not, again, uh, denying the possibilities that such non-class ways of uh, carrying out a revolution, not necessarily a revolution on the model of the uh, Bolshevik revolution or the French revolution, but maybe prolonged uh, 
uh, change over time. All of that is possible. I'm not denying this. But that was not directly my uh, concern in, in the book. Uh, on the question of uh, considering colonialism uh, merely uh, or limiting it to the British experience, I, I would I say yes, of course, because in a sense, uh, since most of my examples from the uh, post-colonial world does come from India, therefore that uh, tends to dominate. Uh, I would still argue that that for even for French colonialism, for instance, a lot, a lot of what I said would still be relevant, or possibly even Dutch colonialism if one thinks of Indonesia. What you're right, I did not consider the South American case. And I didn't for a very specific reason, because that is in a sense was a classic ground for the understanding and, the, and even the literature on populism. Because even Laclau, for instance, the, the, the classic example of uh, populism there was Peronism in, in, in Argentina. And, and later on, a whole series of other populist uh, examples of the more left-wing populisms in more recent times have come out of Latin America. I, I think there's an, an important reason. I mean, there are certain commonalities between the kinds of populism that I've talked about here uh, and the specifically Latin American case, right? But Latin American case with its feature of settler colonialism gives it a different complexion. The idea of the people is not quite the same as the idea of people in other contexts, which are not settler colonial contexts, right? It is settler colonials who think of themselves as people in, in the American case, both North and South. And that, it seems to me, gives it a very, a, a, a dimension to the idea of the people with its rights and in a sense is almost being the founders of a country, right? Uh, where others are simply excluded. And that's where, of course, as you say, the idea of decolonial and so on comes precisely as a critique of that conception of the people as constituted mainly, if not exclusively, by settler, by European settlers. Uh, so uh, I wanted to leave that out because that would have gone into a, a whole extended discussion. Uh, and I'm not entirely competent to go into uh, the history of, of Latin American uh, populism. Uh, it's related to this. The, when I use the word traditional, I've used it in only one very, very limited sense, which is to describe traditional peasant agriculture. That's the only sense in which I've used traditional. And, and that, of course, as you, you're completely right in suggesting that that's not necessarily the uh, main uh, form of production in pre-colonial uh, societies everywhere. Uh, but in, because I was discussing more the Indian case, right? Traditional agriculture was, and its relation to settled villages, was a very, very major part of the understanding of uh, Indian society. And this is what British uh, Indian, British, British Indian rule or, or governments uh, had to depend on. When I say that in the new informal sector, even though they may be rural, they may even call themselves farmers or peasants, but they are not. Now, this is a very new phenomenon. And that's what I was trying to argue, that even though you would still have in India uh, people who live in villages, who maybe even own land, but they are not principal, their principal income is not from agriculture. This is probably true of a majority of people who live in rural India now. And this is a completely new phenomenon, which is a product of the expansion of capital. 
uh, it is a totally modern phenomenon. And that's the sense, the only sense in which I made the distinction or I called uh, the traditional uh, peasant agriculture as traditional as something that has, has basically uh, collapsed now. Uh, finally, your question about the binary and the dichotomy between citizenship and population, I completely accept. The, the dichotomy is an analytical uh, device, right? In any given empirical situation, yes, of course, there are huge overlaps. You will find people who are at the same time considered in some contexts, considered a fully part of civil society, members of civil society, uh, citizens in that sense, and in a different contexts, not so, right? It depends contextually. Uh, it, it may be shifting people who, uh, you know, some of the things that one speaks of, and there are good analytical, uh, uh, empirical studies, for instance, of, of, of production, forms of production in the so-called informal sector. They often occupy a kind of liminal middle zone between being formally corporatized uh, and yet informal in many, many ways. There are sometimes huge enterprises employing hundreds of workers which are not formally corporatized at all. They depend upon caste or familial or village loyalties. You know, credit is not, people don't, are not paid through the banks or the checks, right? People are, these are large enterprises. There are entire towns which operate on this kind of capitalist enterprise. It is completely capitalist and yet it is not formal. So these are, there are all of these kinds of liminal, uh, Phenomena, and of course you're right. But one needs, at least for me, the way I think, uh, a binary is useful as the preliminary analytical category in order to make distinctions. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Partho. Um, I'm sure that uh, all of us uh, on this platform would agree that this has been a very uh, illuminating uh, discussion. So I request those who want to ask questions or make comments to send me a note using the chat function. Just give your name and your institution. Okay, you don't have to give the question. Unless you don't want to say it yourself, then you can write down the question there. We will have about uh, 45 minutes for a general discussion and then we will close. What I'm going to do is uh, uh, recognize three people. Uh, the first is uh, Yosef. Uh, second is uh, David uh, Chimba. And the third is uh, Gizal Walde. Okay. So, Yosef, can you begin, please? Okay. So, I have two questions. Um, uh, the first is about this. Uh, populist governmentality or populism, uh, how do we read it? Uh, is it a response to neoliberal governmentality or is it a new form of neoliberal governmentality? Is it a response or uh, some kind of evolution of the neoliberal uh, governmentality? The second question uh, concerns um, what's the future of this new mode of power, if we read it as a new mode of power, this populist governmentality? Uh, uh, is it in its early stage or what we are looking at now is a, a fully matured mode of power? Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Yosef. Um, David Shimba. Um, thank you, Pato, for the lecture. Um, we saw we saw in the rise to to the Morsi regime in Egypt. We saw that the populist uh, Muslim Brotherhood actually uh, abandoned its uh, long-standing anti-American and anti-Israeli stance in favor of a practical or rather a pragmatic approach that prioritize political interest. 
over ideological position. So my question is, uh, um, how, how can we best theorize uh, populist movement, uh, particularly from the periphery, once they're in power? Thank you. Giselle? Thank you very much. My, my, question, my questions are like, uh, professors, uh, you have explained to us that for the populist leader to emerge, there, there must be a bundling of unmet demands. Uh, my question is, can, is it possible to bundle all unmet demands? Uh, that's my first question. The other question is, um, uh, is it possible uh, for us to have other forms of government other than populist regimes when demands are unmet. And my third question is, you said uh, populist regimes once come, they do not disturb um, the capitalist uh, mode of property relations. Their, their, their task, their, 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 their region survives uh, by distribution of those uh, material wealth to supporters or whatever they are. Uh, so you seem, you seem to, to, uh, to tell us capitalism is just, uh, uh, populist regimes are limited to domestic circumstances where domestic material wealth is distributed by the populist regimes. Can we have other bases, other aspirations to be distributed, other than, other than material things that can trigger uh, 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 populist regimes to power? Thank you very much. Okay. Partho, I think you can take over from here. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> all right, Yusuf. Uh, so is populism a response to neoliberal uh, governmentality or is it a new form of liberal, neoliberal governmentality? No, it's an interesting question. Uh, in general, the response of neoliberal um, the, the proponents of neoliberal uh, government will not accept populism as a valid form of government because the whole argument would be that populism what it does is it uh, it uh, it is wasteful uh, it um, it makes uh, far more uh, far greater expenditures than is uh, legitimate it makes all kinds of promises which actually should not be met. Uh, and so on the whole, it is an inefficient and largely wasteful form of uh, social expenditure, which cannot be justified through the arguments about the rationality of the market and so on, which is the principal way in which neoliberal governmentality would work. Now, the interesting question is, that if it becomes difficult to follow the prescriptions of neoliberal governmentality and keep the peace, keep people happy, right? Then what happens? And that becomes a political question. And very often the interesting argument, often people make this with, in relation to the United States, for instance, where yes, there is a whole range of things that the followers of Trump will want, which neoliberal economists would absolutely not accept. And yet it is clear that a very large part of the, of the establishment is willing to accept Trump and all of this wasteful and often completely irrational kinds of uh, decision-making. Why is that? And that's the interesting political question. Uh, is, is it still hard to argue that populism is a new kind of neoliberal governmentality? Because 
in terms of the actual logic of neoliberalism, uh, populism clearly does not make sense. It is, it is uh, antagonistic. It is opposed to the very idea of a neoliberal market-driven uh, allocation of resources. Uh, on the question of uh, whether this is an early form or is it already a fully mature form, it's very hard to say. Uh, you know, populism, there are, there are, you know, it also has to do with the, uh, with the use of the term, because there are earlier uses of the term. For instance, you have the Narodniks in Russia in the 19th century who are called populists. You have the American phenomenon of American populism, even in the early 20th century, late 19th century. Uh, those kinds of populism are no longer understood as populism in the contemporary sense, where it is clearly located, related to precisely these kinds of forms of contemporary electoral democracy. Uh, so is it still evolving? Are there other things to, that we will see in terms of populism? I, I really cannot make a, a projection on this. Uh, now, the interesting question about Egypt, uh, Morsi, and the Islamic Brotherhood, uh, you see, that, that you, would, you could argue is, is, in fact, the answer that uh, Laclau would give, which is that as an oppositional movement, when you have those populist uh, slogans, right, as when you come to, into government, then given all the constraints that you're under, you simply cannot fulfill all of those uh, demands. And therefore, you fall back upon precisely the logic of difference, differential satisfaction of demands. All demands cannot be satisfied. And you fall back upon this. That is, if, if that is your understanding of what happened with, uh, with the Morsi government, of course, we have to accept that it, it was only there for a very short time. So it, it, you know, we, we can't quite, uh, and clearly not under very normal political circumstances. So, um, but if that's your understanding, then it, it, it falls precisely within the argument that Laclau would make. It's different from the argument which says that with a floating signifier, right, these, these changing demands can be uh, accommodated over time and you could still retain a regime in power, retaining its populist characteristic over time. That's also possible. But clearly, the Morsi case was not like that. Uh, now, Gizawa. Uh, are all unmet demands included? You see, the interesting uh, transformation that populism, a successful populist movement is able to make, is that it's able to turn these heterogeneous unmet demands into a vague category of oppression, right? Of uh, denial by an enemy, right? Uh, that is, is what a successful populist uh, movement can do. Yes. And almost everything is then successfully included within this large category called the people, the authentic, the real people. And the whole argument is that there is a border between the real people, the authentic people, and the rulers who are somehow not part of the people. They are enemies of the people. Uh, so all, you know, all unmet demands are, in fact, successfully incorporated within it. Uh, now, can there be distribution of benefits which is not merely material? Yes. And this is what is precisely done through the ideological dimension. And that can include a whole range of things. So for instance, categorizing the enemy and defeating the enemy. A lot of this will, would happen merely through representations, through, through the play of words, through all kinds of uh, you know, demonstrations of, uh, of rhetorical, uh, performative kinds of um, victories over the enemy. Uh, and it, 
you know, the, the, the ideological dimension, is, which is what I was suggesting, is, is a very, very crucial part of the construction of this idea of a people. And that is not simply material. As I was saying, that the material distribution part, I, I believe, is no longer a very significant uh, characteristic of only populist regimes. Lots of regimes, which you would not otherwise characterize as populist, also does the same thing, which is to say, make promises at the times of elections, and then try and fulfill some of them in order to make the claim that, all right, we've given you this, now vote for us again. So that's a form which is no longer restricted to what I would call characteristically populist regimes today. Thank you. Thank you, Pato. Um, I don't see, if I, have, if I have missed you and you have sent me your name and uh, institution on chat, please uh, resend it to me. Um, meanwhile, Patho, I, I, I have got a question which, uh, which I would like to, to pose. Um, now, you, you began by making a distinction between the rhetorical and the substantive. Um, and I think uh, uh, my, my sense is that your, your presentation was focused very much on the rhetorical. Um, and in, in, in populism as a rhetorical uh, uh, practice, exercise, uh, in making a distinction between right and left-wing populism, um, again, you see right-wing populism is, is uh, far more uh, assertive uh, in the rhetorical domain um, as, 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 as making a sharp rhetorical critique of uh, neoliberalism. You, 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 you take populism as a response to neoliberalism, not necessarily a departure from it, but as a response to neoliberalism. Um, and and, and left-wing uh, uh, populism, um, has really limited uh, sort of focusing on redistribution, but, but, but limited uh, by the capitalist framework and, and, and capitalist relations. Um, so again, uh, I got the impression, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, that, that there's no substantive critique here, or, or the substantive critique is very limited, or populism is at best a kind of a deflection uh, it doesn't. It doesn't provide us any kind of your response to Yosef's question, uh, sort of alternative. Now, within this context, I would like you to uh, to think of China, uh, contemporary China, um, because the Chinese claim to have provided an alternative to neoliberalism within a capitalist framework. Okay. Uh, the Chinese claim that uh, while the rest of uh, the, the uh, industrial democracies, etc., were pursuing a, a, a neoliberal policy, uh, they had lifted neoliberal policy, redistributing income from the poor to the rich. Uh, they were doing the opposite. Uh, they were lifting 300 to 400 million people out of poverty over several decades. Um, now, my question to you is this, uh, do you see the Chinese experience over the last several decades as an alternative to neoliberalism within a capitalist framework? Uh, do you see Xi Jinping um, as, as, a, as, a, as somebody with, with populist aspirations? Um, uh, how, how would you situate uh, the, the post-Mao contemporary Chinese experience within your understanding of populism? Okay. Uh, in relation to the distinction between right-wing and left-wing populisms, uh, as I... Uh, tried to explain my argument, especially in relation to people who've been making the claim uh, in favor of uh, left-wing 
uh, populism, uh, Chantal Mouffe, for instance. Uh, the, as I see it, left-wing populism, you're right in saying that in the, in the substantive realm, uh, it, it attempts a redistribution of incomes, a, a trying to, to uh, minimize the, the scale of uh, and the sharpness of the inequalities, uh, but within the broader framework of a capitalist uh, structure of property and capitalist forms of production. Also, particularly uh, in terms of an acceptance of the need for globalized forms of capital. It seems to me that left-wing capitalist, uh, left-wing uh, populists have been far less critical of globalization. And they have always emphasized the, uh, you know, in a sense, the more uh, liberating aspects of globalization, not, not simply, you know, the fact, the fact that there is mobility, that there is a much free, a greater freedom of uh, movements and so on, uh, movements of ideas, etc., culture, the aspects of globalization. This, this, this seems to be fairly uh, important aspects of what left-wing populists think uh, should be maintained. Uh, on the other hand, right-wing populists, one of the interesting things about their relation to capital is that certainly the, the ones that, I mean, Trump is, a, of course, a, a, a very good example of this, that there is a critique of globalization. And there is an argument that it is globalization which has created the inequalities. It is globalized forms of, of, of this kind of, particularly the financial side of, of globalized economy that had uh, produced um, the, the, uh, the Wall Street kinds of uh, uh, wealth of some people. Uh, it has exacerbated the, the scale of inequalities. It has also led to the rise of China as a major competitor to the West. And, and clearly, right-wing populists have been against this uh, in, a, in, in sometimes quite radical kinds of ways. Now, whether this represents an attempt to, or a successful uh, way of restructuring uh, the forms of capital today, we don't know. We just don't know. Uh, and, uh, you know, clearly um, somebody like Trump is trying, apparently, to, to, in fact, recreate the older forms of, you know, manufacturing capital in the United States, rather than having everything manufactured by China. Uh, which brings me to the question of China. In relation to my discussion, there are all sorts of other things we can talk about in relation to China. But in relation to populism, the important thing about China is that it is clearly a, an immensely successful case of capitalist growth, probably you know, the most spectacular kind of capitalist growth seen in, in history. And yet it has been achieved without any form of electoral democracy. Now, if that is the case, when you say does it represent, and it is also now possibly the biggest defender of globalization today. Now, if that is the case, <clears throat> then what is populist about this? One, in terms of my argument of contemporary populism, uh, Xi Jinping does not have to, to fight elections and create electoral opponents and defeat them. You know, that's the, the standard form in which populists require affirmation of support from the people. Xi Jinping does not have to do that. Uh, and if that's the case, then the whole construction of a populist leader as a sovereign-like figure chosen by the people, right, and therefore defending the people against enemies is not quite the description that I would make of, of, of Xi Jinping. And, and therefore, the Chinese case is, uh, does not seem to me to fit the idea of populism in the way it's, 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 it's emerged in more recent times. 
Um, thank you. We have uh, two questions um, or comments. The first is from uh, Emmanuel, and the second is from uh, Jonathan Mujeni. Uh, Emmanuel, can you, and, and a third, and a third from uh, uh, Conrad uh, John Masabo from the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, Emmanuel, can you begin, please? Okay. Thank you, Professor. Many thanks to Professor for your presentation. My question is, when does populism become a threat to democracy, given the fact that populist leaders tend to seek legitimacy through regular elections, and also due to the fact that these leaders mobilize around popular demands of some sections of the population? So when does populism become a threat to democracy given these two factors as you discussed? Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan? Professor, and uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Pata. It was an honor um, listening to you. Um, Professor Pata, I'm particularly impressed by your discussion on the popular versus populism. And uh, I have just one question in this regard. Um, are there instances, recorded instances, where a popular government turns populist? And when did this happen? What are the signifying practices to this effect? And the second question is, are there instances where a populist government becomes popular? And what are the signifying practices and the reasons behind this? That's my simple question. Thank you. Um, Conrad Masabo. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, I have one question to Professor Pacham. Uh, with the COVID-19, online politics or social life seems to be the possible mode of life that we are to face in the future. So in line of this, if this COVID is going to take us online, what could be your comments on the nature and the, the possible elements of populism when life goes online? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Arthur? Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Emmanuel. Now, when does populism become a threat to democracy? Now, clearly they, here you don't have to uh, make a, a, a more precise, uh, dis produce a more precise description of what you mean by democracy because populists would claim they are Democrats because Populist leaders are validated; they are popularly elected, uh, and therefore, and and they serve the people, and therefore, they are uh, they are not a threat to democracy. But clearly, there is a distinction here between, and this is where certain model, modular forms of democracy become important. What is understood as liberal democracy, right? the forms of competitive representative government, uh, forms by which you make distinctions between, let's say, the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch, the division of powers, right? Those kinds of things. <coughs> the populist regimes threaten that kind of institutional separation. Now, the interesting question is, that those separations of between the branches of government and so on, if you go back even to the 18th century when these kinds of institutions were first founded, most classically in the American constitution, the idea of this, the, the, the separation of powers was really to prevent any, something like populism emerging. It was actually to keep the direct impact of popular mobilizations affecting the rational forms of government. 
And that is why you, the idea was you could not have an executive, a president, for instance, becoming an absolute power or the legislative branch becoming an absolute power or the judges becoming an absolute power. And it is precisely to prevent this kind of absolutism that liberal democracy was, uh, was, was created. Now, one of the things that is distinctive about contemporary populism is that the populist leader not only claims to be uh, a sovereign-like absolute uh, leader, but in fact, their followers expect the leader to be absolutist, to exercise absolute powers, right? And get rid of all of the paraphernalia of bureaucratic regulations and so on and so forth, because in the idea of ordinary people, his followers, it is precisely those rules of law and bureaucracy and all of those kinds of things which prevent justice from being delivered to the people. And therefore, the leader is expected to cut through all of that and give them the, their, you know, satisfy their demands. Uh, this, therefore, is where both, you could, you could argue that populism will threaten the conventionally understood forms of liberal democracy. Uh, this raise, leads to the next question by, by Jonathan, between populist and popular. Now, uh, once again, the question is, how do you understand the term popular in relation to populism? Again, the populist leader will claim that I am popular. Look, the people vote for me. They have elected me. They love me, and so on and so forth. Why am I not popular? And again, the idea of popular here needs to be qualified by the understanding of what the sense of popular is. Popular in the formal sense, right, which is the people as the foundation of sovereignty. That is something that whether it's popul populism or whether it's liberal democracy, they all hold this. Now, something where government is for the people, and this is where there are very interesting distinctions because the populist leader will claim what I am doing is for the people. The people cannot act, the people cannot satisfy their demands on their own, I will have to step in and do it for them, right? Now, this is somewhat different from the understanding of representation in a liberal democracy. Because in a liberal democracy, the idea of representation is always conditioned by these constitutional forms, that the representative only does this and nothing else. The executive is something else. But the, the, the responsibility, for instance, between, let us say, uh, a, 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 a parliament and a president or, or, or uh, uh, a, a prime minister or a cabinet of ministers is a, a mutual relationship of, of responsibility. But the president, once elected for the next term, whatever the term is, is not directly responsible to the people every day. But this is where the populist leader or the populist movement cuts through the traditional understanding of popular government as a representative government. And that's the interesting and important distinction. Populism will still maintain that we are, we are a popular government, except it's no longer the liberal form of representative government. Now, uh, online populism. Now, one of the things we have to, at least I, I believe that we should be careful about making projections as to how much of life will become online. Because I'm not sure that everything will become online, nor am I sure at all that most people in most countries will become online in quite this sense. So therefore something like, uh, you know, an understanding of, uh, let's say democracy, which is online, um, it's, it's still very much in the future. I'm not sure something like, you know, uh, through Zoom, you organize an entire uh, 
let's say, election campaign organized through Zoom, I am not sure how that will work. Maybe these forms will emerge. I, I have no idea how that would, be, would, that would be like. But it would certainly not be uh, anything like the democratic forms that we have known so far. It would be something quite different. I, I cannot, I don't have the powers of imagination to think of, think of what that kind of society might be like. Thank you. Well, the uh, Democratic primary in the state of New York uh, on, uh, on June 23 is going to be entirely by postal ballot. Yes. And the campaign is also online. Campaign is online and, uh, and the voting will be by postal ballot, uh, which means it will not necessarily be a secret ballot. Yeah. Um, it is much easier for uh, uh, any, any patriarch or matriarch uh, <laughs> to organize their constituency to vote along a particular line. So we'll be seeing many shifts and changes. Um, I, I, I also wanted to uh, slightly rephrase my question on, on China to say, not China as a form of populism, uh, but, uh, but China as an alternative to neo, as a capitalist alternative to neoliberal capitalism. That's, yes, that, that's the question I would be interested in. Absolutely, absolutely. No, that's, something, that's something that's already established. Uh, what this means uh, in terms of uh, you know, it becoming a kind of model that may be replicated elsewhere, we just don't know. Because on the other hand, you know, the Chinese model, if you think of it, is also uh, crucially a product of an entire history, which is so unique to the Chinese case, where you have possibly clearly, you know, a revolutionary change involving the largest number of people, right? Uh, claiming a socialist revolution, right? And then that same party re remaining intact converting the entire production system into the form of a, one of the biggest manufacturing uh, capitalist uh, countries in the world uh, is unprecedented clearly. And I doubt that it's something that can be replicated in quite that form. So specific things from the Chinese case could certainly now and particularly in the present context, where I think in country after country, there will be a pressure now, especially given the, uh, the present epidemic, and depending on how long this, this situation of a kind of health emergency, uh, how long it, it, it persists. If it persists for a year or two, then clearly there will be pressure to centralize decision-making in the hands of an executive rather than you know, have these long discussions in, in legislatures and, and campaigns and so on and so forth, because the idea would be you have to make quick decisions, you have to make decisions that have immediate impact on people's lives and therefore, and, and of course the involvement of experts uh, who are not elected people, right? Who clearly have a kind of technical knowledge which ordinary legislators and so on do not have. And all of this would increase the pressure for precisely the kind of command that the Communist Party formally exercises. Without, I'm not suggesting that you would have a, a formal organization similar to a, a communist party, but something of that kind around an executive power could well emerge as well, which would say that we have to organize both the economy as well as daily lives of people. In other words, combine economy with the biopolitical functions in the form of a clear executive authority. If that's the case, well, the Chinese model is a very good model. We have uh, about seven minutes left, and I have one question here from uh, 
uh, Juliet, I think it's Juliet Kushabe. Here's Juliet's question. Um, as Professor Chatterjee speaks of populists thinking of themselves as Democrats, he makes me imagine a term, induced democracy. I think the kind of democracy that populist politics breeds is in fact induced through especially their action of distributing to the population what they need. Partho? Yes, that's, that's a possible description. Uh, it's uh, it's induced, but but the um, think of the the other side uh, because it's also a response to demands, right? It is not necessarily that it's the uh, it's the leader or the party, the populist party in power, which uh, uh, which creates demands, right? It it responds to demands. Um, in particular ways, of course, uh, and in that sense, you know, in, induced suggests this move from one direction to the other, uh, from the direction of those who are wielding powers onto those uh, who are the people. What's interesting about populism is precisely this much, much more direct appearance. Now, it's it's it could only be an appearance, but the much more direct appearance of the people actually telling their leader, this is what we want, this is what you must give us. And we expect you, and we believe you will be able to deliver that for us. Which, you know, this could include not just material things, by the way, as I, I emphasized even earlier. It could even mean uh, by, let's say, you know, throw those people out. Uh, those are, are, are our enemies. You should fight them. Um, you shouldn't. We shouldn't give space to them. You know, demote them to the uh, status of a second-class citizens or whatever. It could be even be that. So a lot of populist demands end up being sort of hateful uh, campaigns against minorities or or others. And and even there, the populist leader is expected to deliver. So. Uh, I think it's but it's it's important to understand this this relationship between the populist leader of the populist party and their supporters, quote unquote, the people, and that relationship uh, works both ways. But the the important thing is that it's it tends to not be mediated. It's it's a much more direct relationship. The the leader prefers always to speak directly to the people without the mediation of, you know, representatives, legislatures, bureaucrats, and so on and so forth in the middle. So we have a last question right now. Uh, this question is from uh, Anna, Anna Karthik. Uh, Anna asks, how should we read political polarization as a constitutive element of populism in a leader's or populist government's response to the demands of the people. And Partho, you should feel free to sum up the discussion uh, after your response to this question. Mm, polarization, well, <clears throat> polarization is, is something that, that will necessarily follow from the populist uh, variety of politics, because as I said, you know, it depends crucially on this, creating this internal frontier between the people on one side and the people's enemies on the other. And the people's enemies could be um, it's supposedly all of those who stand in the way of the people uh, gain, gaining or getting their demands, their just, their just demands. Uh, so, if it could be a polarization between two parties, one party, supposedly the, uh, the party of the establishment and the other, the populists who are trying to disrupt the whole thing. Or if when you come to a populist party in power or a populist leader in power, all the opponents, political opponents, they will be characterized as the leader's enemies and therefore the people's enemies 
who have to be defeated and defeated electorally in order to confirm that the leader in fact has the full support of his, the genuine people. And so polarization, it seems to me, is absolutely an inevitable part of uh, the, the forms of populist politics. Uh, well, um, I don't know how to sum this up, except to, to say that one of the things that we should be careful is that, yeah, one of the things we should be careful is that I've attempted uh, a kind of analytical, uh, conceptual uh, description of populism on the basis of more recent contemporary phenomena. Uh, much of this uh, is dependent upon uh, the way the world has moved in, let us say, the last 20 years or so. Uh, now, because it, this is such a, you know, if you think of larger histories, uh, this is such a small period of time. And what's happened in this space, already, for, even from our discussion today, we seem to be thinking that many of the things we took to be part of our contemporary world, the ordinary experience of the contemporary world, seems to be changing suddenly. And we already are saying, we don't know what's, what democracy is going to look like two years from now. Now, you know, this is, this is not the usual way in which we normally think about, you know, political change or social change. Uh, but yes, it, it, I mean, this may, it may not be. I mean, two years from now, we may uh, say, well, why did we think of all of this as a, as a huge uh, uh, world turning upside down kind of uh, phenomenon, maybe things will be fairly normal as we've seen this, but maybe not. And that's the whole uncertainty of the present moment uh, when we are having to discuss many of these things. And therefore, there is always this huge question mark that's hanging on any of our conclusions uh, which we may draw. So uh, I'm very much aware of this. And so many of these discussions will remain under the spell of this question mark. Maybe we'll have an opportunity a few months from now, or maybe a year from now, or two years from now, to return again, assemble once more, and, and take stock of all the things that we've said today and how we were right or we were wrong. I'll stop there. I'm glad, I'm glad you ended with that promise. We will certainly hold you to it. Uh, and we will we will come back for a return session. Thank you very much, Partho. Uh, this was very illuminating. Um, next week uh, we will have uh, same day next Wednesday a lecture by Professor Judith Butler uh, from uh, the uh, University of California at uh, Berkeley. Professor Butler will be talking about uh, who is afraid of gender. Uh, professor Butler is a professor of uh, uh, comparative literature, but also best known for her work in gender and uh, queer theory. The time will be different because she's going to be speaking at 8 a.m. San Francisco time, which will be 6 p.m. in East Africa. Okay, so we'll be sending you a notice uh, uh, and, and uh, please feel free to register. Thank you very much, Paso. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to join us next Wednesday and ever after. Thank you. Yeah.